Good morning to you all and welcome to the service of Holy Eucharist during this blessed season of Epiphany. Welcome from all the parishioners here at St. Margaret's Episcopal Church in Emmaus, Pennsylvania. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and blessed be God's kingdom now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, Christ have, have mercy. mercy. Lord, have mercy. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty and everlasting God, you govern all things, both in heaven and on earth. Mercifully hear the supplications of your people, and in our time, grant us your peace. Through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. A reading from Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more or ever again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, they are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. Hear what the Spirit is, hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. The psalm for today is Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are the deeds of the Lord, they are studied by all who delight in them. His work is full of majesty and splendor, and his righteousness endures forever. He makes his marvelous works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He gives food to those who fear him. He is ever mindful of his covenant. He has shown his people the power of his works in giving them the lands of the nations. The work of his hands are faithfulness and justice. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. He sent redemption to his people. He commanded his covenant forever. Holy and awesome is his name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Those who act accordingly have a good understanding. His praise endures forever. A reading from 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something 
does not yet have the necessary knowledge. But anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, as in fact there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom are all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge, since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, and no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if, if others see you who possess knowledge eating, the, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to the point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it is weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cost, cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. Hear what the Spirit is saying to God's people. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Mark. Praise to you, Lord Christ. Jesus and his disciples went into Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then, there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him, crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, what is this? A new teaching with authority? He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to the Lord Christ. In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. This brief passage from the Gospel of Mark tells a very strange story. Now just imagine, some Sunday morning after the scripture readings, 
somebody walks into the service, muscles the clergy out of the pulpit, and begins preaching with great brilliance and power. Well, like the folks in the synagogue, we would be astonished. Astonished at the event itself, and even more surprised when the person preached with authority, as though he or she had every right to be there instead of being a gate crasher. How much more amazing it would be, though, if in the midst of that sermon by the interloping preacher, another person leaped up and began yelling at the preacher, saying, I know who you are. Why are you here? Are you planning to destroy me? And then the yeller started having convulsions and shrieking. Well, that alone would have us all up on our feet, and most of us would be grabbing our cell phones and dialing 911 for the police and for an ambulance. And what if following those first two amazing events, the unexpected preacher turned to the screamer and said quietly, be still, let the disease come out of you. After rolling around a bit more and the person shrieking once or twice, then suddenly the person becomes still, gets up, appearing to have become entirely normal and is healed from whatever affliction has been in control. Three happenings on a Sunday morning, each more amazing than the next. Certainly, the service would come to a halt at that moment, while we all wondered about the preacher who was powerful enough to heal someone's physical or mental illness instantly with a few words. If it occurred at St. Margaret's, what do you think we would be talking about at coffee hour? About how the preacher came in and disrupted our beautifully planned service? About the miraculous healing that we had just witnessed? I dare say that pretty low on the list of things to discuss would be whether the preacher was teaching some new doctrine or a critique of preaching style. There are real surprises in this gospel story. We expect to hear that Jesus is a powerful preacher. We expect to see him perform miracles. But we don't expect the congregation in the synagogue almost to ignore the miracle and focus on Jesus and his teaching. The text makes a point of distinguishing Jesus' preaching from that of the scribes. Now, the scribes were a lot more important than just people trained to copy out scripture or to jot down the words of learned rabbis and teachers. The scribes were the foremost biblical scholars of their day. It was their job to study the law and the prophets and to interpret it to the people. The authority of the scribes stemmed from, stemmed from the ancient texts that they worked on and from other traditional commentators. They would never have claimed that they spoke with their own authority. So Jesus' authority was notably different. Instead of claiming approval from ancient texts, Jesus preached on his own authority, about himself and in his Father's name. And this qualitative difference was so profound it excited more interest than an exorcism. Imagine that. How could people believe Jesus' authority? 
Well, in addition to his words, he provided signs to underscore that his claims were valid, such as the report of the healing of the man with the unclean spirit. In ancient times, it was believed that illness of this kind was caused by evil spirits. Gospel accounts of them seem to indicate that the spirits have intellect and will and could get into debates with people. These days, we might interpret them psychologically and call the spirits parts of the unconscious. Notice that in this passage, the so-called spirit initiates the interaction. Some part of the sick man's mind might have recognized Jesus for what he was, and he draws the attention of Jesus and the congregation to himself. Maybe he knew at some unconscious level that the great physician had come near. Or maybe he was frightened by Jesus and wanted to manipulate him subtly, flattering him and calling him the Holy One of God. In those days, traditional exorcisms were long, drawn out, and very exciting events. But unlike other healers, Jesus refuses to be sidetracked from his message by the activity of the unclean spirit. He does not engage in debate. He does not waste any time in explanation. He says simply, stop it. He heals the man and continues on with his preaching. His audience would have recognized that only someone with divine power far greater than the power of a mere spirit, would be able with such ease and grace to expel that spirit. Today's gospel provides a challenge for us as well. We are to become both like the scribes and like Christ. There's no question that as Christians, Part of our authority lies in the scriptures. We're separated by 2,000 years from the events of Jesus' life and by many more thousands from the Hebrew Bible. Reading and studying scripture is one of the ways in which we obtain a grounding for our faith. And through ongoing encounters with the word of God, our faith develops. But we cannot make the error that the scribes did. Mere academic focus on a text, even on a sacred text, is only half of the process. We're also called to develop a living personal connection with the Holy One. We need to allow ourselves to be changed and influenced through direct contact with Christ in prayer and sacraments. Study alone risks producing the kind of sterile, intellectual activity that the scribes were famous for. On the other hand, individual experience alone risks creating religious events unconsciously designed to meet our own private preferences. Scripture allows us to confirm the validity of personal experience. And personal experience of the holy gives fire and energy to the teachings of Scripture. As Christians, we are meant to carry the message of the gospel to the world like Jesus did. Take a look at Mark 16 when you get a chance. That's our employment contract. Go into all the world and proclaim the good news to the whole creation. It's not negotiable. Sometimes I do wonder how much the people around us realize that we are Christians. 
Do our friends recognize that there's something that sets us apart? Do our co-workers see that there is some inner core that informs our values, which causes us to live a different kind of life? Or are we like the scribes, saying the right things, but never taking the next step to allow what we have learned to have impact on us? Are we like the unclean spirit in today's gospel, recognizing Jesus when we see him, but failing to turn away from our own vices? Jesus offers us, calls us, to the possibility of transformation. He invites us to become spiritually whole, driving out the personal demons that separate us from God, and to turn us from someone whose faith is theoretical into a vibrant embodiment of Christ. Not only is this a benefit to us personally, it assists in sharing the good news. People are not likely to take seriously someone who claims to be a Christian, but whose life is entirely self-focused and whose faith is expressed as a joyless keeping of rules. Now, we don't expect that we will have the same kind of power and authority that Jesus did. Jesus is God after all. And I hope we won't be seeing a lot of exorcisms in the church on Sundays. But we can expand our own inner authority through active contemplation and study of the scriptures. And we can match that with surrendering our resistance to change so Christ can draw us closer to himself. In doing that, we also surrender the obstacles we put up, our own personal unclean spirits. Amen. Now let us together proclaim our faith through the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten and not made, of the one being with the Father. Through him all things were made, for us and for our salvation. He came down from heaven by the power of the Holy Spirit. He became incarnate in the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate, he suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, with the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. 
We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for our own needs and the needs of others in the name of Jesus of Nazareth, the Holy One of God, saying, hear our prayer. For the church, and especially for Michael, our presiding bishop, and Kevin, our bishop. For Trinity, Bethlehem, Grace Church, Allentown, and St. Paul's, Englewood, New Jersey, that we may live and teach the gospel of love. Holy One of God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For this parish family, that we who gather to hear the Lord's teaching may fully respond to all that God asks of us. Holy One of God, hear, hear our, our prayer. prayer. For this nation and for the members of Congress and legislatures, that they will hear and understand the needs of the powerless and marginalized as they develop priorities and solutions. Holy One of God, hear our prayer. For all who are prophets, that they may understand the mind and heart of God and awaken new insights for the renewal and growth of both the church and society. Holy One of God, hear our prayer. For all those for whom we ought to pray, remembering especially Jackson, Father Don, Toby, Millie, Tony, Megan, Jane, Wani, Carly, Cindy, Dominic, Thaddeus, Ted, Taylor, Ray, and Marlene, Lori, Andrew, Chris, Elizabeth, Michelle, Gail, Fran, Ryan, Pam, Terry, Robert, Marianne, Suzanne, Eric, Kate, Joshua, Marianne, Jody, Mother Gwendolyn Jane, Jessica, William, Amelia, Karen, Rada, Jose, Jen, Stacy, Julius, and Mother Laura. For those in the military and all first responders, especially those in harm's way and their families, Sean, Will, Jamie, Andrew, Zachary, Kyle, and Kevin, that they may know the light of God's healing presence and that God will strengthen them with grace and compassion. Holy One of God, hear our prayer. For those who have died, that they may live in the presence of the Holy One of God, hear our prayer. Lifting our voices with all creation, with Mary the God-bearer, Elizabeth, Benedict, and all the saints, let us offer ourselves and one another to the living God through Christ. To, to you, you, O Lord, Lord our God. Holy One of God, you come to teach us with authority and to set our spirits free. Hear our prayers and give us strength and courage as we proclaim your truth by word and by deed. Glory to you forever and ever. Amen. Amen. And now let us confess our sins against God and against our neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have loved undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We 
have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ. Strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. Amen. And now may the peace and joy of the Lord be with you always. And they will also be with you. All things come of thee, O Lord, and of thine own have we given thee. The Lord be with you, and also with you. Lift up your hearts, we lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give God thanks and praise. It is good and a joyful thing, always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, because in the mystery of the Word made flesh, you have caused a new light to shine in our hearts, to give the knowledge of your glory in the face of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy and gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. 
We celebrate the memorial of our redemption of Father in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And now, as our blessed Savior Christ has taught us, we now pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia. Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia. These are the gifts of God for the people of God. And now let us pray the prayer of spiritual reception. My Jesus, I believe that you are present in the most holy sacrament. I love you above all things and I desire to receive you into my soul. Since I cannot at this moment receive you sacramentally, come at least spiritually into my heart. I embrace you as if you were already there and unite myself wholly to you. Never permit me to be separated from you. Amen. And let us pray, eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. And may Christ, the Son of God, be manifest in you, that your lives may be a light to the world. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you and those whom you love this day and always. Amen. Amen. Now let us go forth into the world, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Alleluia. Thanks be to God. Alleluia. Alleluia.